Hi, welcome to the Semantics Lecture Light about ontologies. Now, ontologies are simply the set of objects that we assume to exist for our semantics or for our you know, logic. And uh, they can be quite a number of things. And what we'll find though is that there's a limited number of types of things that uh, we know, that we assume to exist or that we accept to exist, uh, or at least that we accept the semantics to be dealing with. And uh, the way that these combine will help us manage and predict the kinds of expressions that can compose with each other. Now these semantic types uh, will help us set the d domains for our functions. And they arose out of the work of Montague, and he divided saturated expressions into two basic types. There is type E for entities, and there is type T or truth values. So when we say that uh, an entity like me or uh, this book or the planet Earth, these are all individuals. They're you know, things that aren't really broken down. T for truth values, the truth values are simply one and zero. Now for each type, we can define a set of objects of that type. We can do that using the domain uh, function essentially. So what we say then is that d sub e is the set of all individuals. And we'd say that d sub t is the set of all truth values. And those are essentially 1 and 0. So now we can dis describe our functions in these terms. Right? So earlier we had a function from the set of individuals to the set 1, 0. Well, now we can define it a little bit more clearly from the set of entities to the set of truth values, type E, type T. And we can characterize the function by its type as well. So individuals are of type E, they're individual entities. Truth values are of type T. But functions have types as well. And the types are essentially uh, an ordered pair of the type of its domain and the type of its range. So for instance, are functions that we've seen, uh, a verb like fall. Its domain is of type E. Anything that is in its domain is an individual or an entity with the type E. And anything that's in its range is a truth value, one or zero. So we end up with E, T. And that's an ordered pair. And that works out pretty well. Right? And so we can define our functions in terms of that. So uh, if you look at an uh, uh, example like run, with the verb run is a function from the domain of individuals. So it takes something of type E. And it gives you something of type T, that is the sentence after the, the last dot. And uh, you say run of x, and remember that is an abbreviation. It's, a, it's an abbreviation of 1 if x runs, 0 if x doesn't. 1 or 0, the truth values. So this will be of type t. And so this function is of type et, and we can write it like this, type et. Now, how how can we, how does this help us? Well, we can characterize in the interpretability or the, comp, the composability of functions in this way. So let's take a, a name like Eric, and that's going to be, you know, the denotation of Eric is going to be the person Eric, and that's a type E. So what happens when we compose these? So if we have 
Eric, which is composed via uh, terminal nodes, non branching nodes. And then we have run and the x and d sub e run x. Well, this is of type e, this is of type et. And now we can see this is a function. It takes and it takes entities as its argument. Gives you truth value. Well, this is an entity. So because these match, we know that this can be plugged into that. And so we get run of Eric. And that will be of type T. And that's how that we can do that every time. When we have a function, its sister will have to have this type. It's the mother will have to have this type. Otherwise, it will not compose. So we know that a sentence like Eric run, Eric, yeah, run, um, is interpretable. But we also know that a sentence like Eric ran runs is not interpreted. Why not? Well, what would it look like? Let's say that we could build it in the syntax. That's not a given. But even if we could, even if we could, we'd have Eric of type E, and then ran. And perhaps we can combine it with this, run x. And so we can combine these because that's a type et. So this would be a type e. The output will be a type t. So run eric of type t. Now, we have another function, right? eric run runs. And so it's going to be a second function. So this is a function of type et. Why can't we combine these? Well, this will only take something of type e. But this is a type t. So this cannot be an input to this function, which means we can never saturate this, and it's not going to be interpreted. It will not compose. And so we get that result. And so essentially, then, we can uh, use the types, the semantic types, to categorize functions, to categorize entities and truth values and other objects that we'll see. And in doing so, we can help limit the kinds of compositions that we, that we uh, get. And we can make predictions about the types of objects that we'll want. And that's going to be a really useful uh, kind of thing. So, what about a transitive loop? Well, a transitive verb will have two arguments. The transitive verb, right? So let's say um, when the x, right? What is it? its first argument is going to be an individual. Its second argument is going to be an individual, and then it will return a truth value. All right, sees x of y, that is to say, 1 if y sees x, and 0 otherwise. So, what is the type of this? Well, we can actually formulate it, right? It's a it's a curried function, so we give it something of type E. And what does it give us? This. And what is this? Well, this is a function again, right? It's from type E to type T. That is to say, you feed it one, then you feed it another, and you get your truth value. Two arguments in a row. And that's a type. That will be the type of transitive. Now we could keep defining types in this way. We will. There'd be a lot of different expressions with different types. Uh, and 
early on, it was thought that you know each linguistic, each uh, phrase structure rule had its own kind of type uh, driven system and its own uh, semantic rule of interpretation. So, um, just to give an example, right, we have S to NPVP. Well, it was, uh, this is in the 70s, it was thought that there was a semantic rule corresponding to this phrase structure rule. And uh, it would map it, you know, like this. Uh, VP and then NP, the meaning of NP would be its argument. So this would be the syntax mapped to the semantics um, and then so on for all the other phrase structure rules. Well that worked in the 70s but then as we moved into a, a more generalized X-bar theory for syntax where these phrase structure rules were phased out in favor of a small set of universal rules that applied in lots of different places uh, the semantics went the same route. And so, uh, you know, for a lot of the same reasons, right? It, it, you know, this phrase structure rules were very stipulative, they didn't, and they missed a lot of important generalizations about phrase structure. And the same goes for these. Uh, these semantic rules missed a lot of important facts about how types are put together. And one of the things that we can determine about types is that any time you have a function of type, let's say A, B, and it's sisters of type A, then the mother will be of type B. And we can thus say, instead of having all these different rules, that any time you have this kind of structure, functional application applies. And, uh, we'll be able to make that kind of determination for other kinds of, for the other rules as well. So, we have our little types here, and we have the type of individuals, type for two thighs, the type of nouns and intransitive verbs, which take an entity and tell you true or false depending on whether it has that property or not, type of transitive verb. Now, we can generalize over that. We don't even have to say that. Because both of those types are constructed in the same way. Type of the domain, the type of the range. Type of the domain, type of the range. Type of the domain, type of the range, and so forth. We can make a generalization there too. And we can say generally, if S and T are types, or I should say, if sigma and tau are types, or the Greek letters there, if these are types, then this is a type 2. That is to say, any two types that you can have, you put them together, you make a type. So E and T, you can make a type. E is a type, T is a type. That, that will be a type. E, T is a type. So you can combine E is a type, E, T is a type, and E, T. E, T is a type, also, and then E is a type, so you can build a type like this. And we've seen some of these, we'll see more of these. Right? You can build any type you want that way out of these objects. And so what we are able to do is define sets of functions in terms of these domains. And this helps us organize the objects that we are assuming in our ontology. And uh, as far as any semantic analysis goes, we want to, we want to be clear about what objects we're using, uh, in part because not everyone agrees on what objects are out there. So we, we start off by saying you know, we assume these to exist, and we can develop semantic types based on them, semantic types that we call simple types. And then we can create complex types out of any type. And we can build that recursively, and we can use these combinations to determine what the nature of uh, a linguistic expression's sister and mother ought to be. So the semantic types is a very powerful kind of system, and we'll keep using it throughout the semester. We want to keep track of what the types of each of our expressions are, 
and it will help us figure out how they get how they get put together. And that is ultimately one of our main goals. 